Ginger Hirsch, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. COVID-19 has taken its toll on education, and higher education has not been spared. Today I speak with Dr. Daisy Coco de Filipes, the president of Postos Community College, about the challenges of being a pandemic president and coping with its many difficulties. We will also hear from Dr. Latoro Yates, Postos Vice President for Student Development and Enrollment Management about getting colleges and universities back on track. Coming up now on EdCast. <music> Joining me today is Dr. Daisy Coco de Filipes, President of Postos Community College and the first Dominican woman to serve as a CUNY College President. She came to Hostos in 2020 after serving as president of Naugatuck Valley Community College. No stranger to Hostos, she served as its provost and senior vice president of academic affairs from 2002 to 2008. Dr. Coco de Filipis came on board as president during the COVID-19 pandemic, and she has led the college through tumultuous times in fulfilling its mission to serve its minority student body. A celebrated scholar in the fields of Dominican women's studies and Dominican authors, Dr. Coco de Filipes has also served on the board of multiple educational and community organizations, as well as commissioner for the New England Commission for Higher Education. Thank you so much for joining me today on EdCast. It is truly my pleasure to have my president, President Coco de Filipes of Postos Community College join me today. I want to, first of all, congratulate you and all of us on our successful middle states evaluation, especially during a pandemic. And I know the team recognized many of the college's strengths. So maybe you would just like to tell us just some of the highlights of that visit. Well, let me begin by saying that I am the most fortunate woman. This is I speak to one of my favorite professors. <laughs> That's the truth and she knows it. Um, uh, to come back to a college with so many talented people care for the students. So the first thing that was really, really helpful was, uh, in a sense, that the college is really living its mission, that the college, above all, distinguishes itself for his, uh, for his dedication to our social justice equity mission. And that came clear when the uh, chair of the visiting team came the fall, came virtually, because they came virtually, as you know, uh, and, and met the faculty and staff and spoke with the students and administrators. They, he said, and he wrote a note to me that he felt humble to be before such dedicated professionals who really care about helping the least prepared students that, that enter CUNY College and that do it very successfully as compared to the, uh, for example, if you look at 2021, summer 2021, our students, uh, uh, the National Students Clearinghouse, our students were retaining. Are we retaining students as much as we want to improve and we keep aiming to improve and we will continue to improve? We were above 8%, the national average for schools like ours. And when it came to Latinx students, it was six point something percent because the, the retention here was high for that group to begin with. But with black students, 17%, which was an eye opener. The college is really this bridge of opportunity, this uh, wonderful uh, immigrant college, you know, founded by Puerto Rican leaders with the assistance of many others. It is now a place where 50% of our students were born elsewhere. Our population is about 36 to 38% on any given semester, African American. Afro -Caribbean, Black, African-American, Afro-Caribbean, and Western African. So what really sold me, when because I was, we were all holding our breath, Linda, as you know, okay. When, they be, when he began, which is something that appears, that will appear in the final draft, and was also very well received when I read those lines to the Council of Presidents at CUNY, they were thrilled, which is that they congratulated the college uh, the President Coco de Filippis and all her colleagues for having produced a passionate, elegant, and thoughtful self-study. 
that tells you everything. This is what we are. We're passionate, but we're elegant and we are thoughtful. So I think that was recognized. And I think also the fact was that we have really wonderful, there's we're over a hundred colleagues who work on this, but the leaders were Professor uh, Kate Wolf and Professor Nelson Nunez Rodriguez and our own Dean uh, uh, Babette Odan, who was so wonderful about really making the connections and being sort of the liaison to them. So uh, there's nothing but gratitude. It, it places, I mean, and everything was going on last week. We also had our visitor the, the, from the CUNY Leadership Program, Dr. Erico Chito Childs, whose president told me this weekend in Albany how grateful she was that what a splendid reception because you all different people sent her different emails who met with her and what have you. She just absolutely loved Austos and all of us. That's fantastic. So, so that's who we are at Austos. That's who we are. And okay? it, was so, it was so inclusive a process as well. So I really want to congratulate you on that as well. Everyone was involved, I mean, I have to say. I, I've always been wanting to ask you this question. Um, you were at Hostos, um, and then you left to become the president of Utnogatuck, and then you came back. And I always wondered, what was your impression of Hostos after being away and coming back? What was the same? What was different? What was your impression? You know, you, you saw it with different eyes all of a sudden. What was it like to you coming back? Coming back, first of all, I would come back, Linda, at the drop of a hat, even <laughs> though I love, I love Nagato Valley and we did do really good work over there for 12 years. But when I had a phone call from retiring president, David Gomez, he said, I'm, I'm going to be retiring. And the chancellor asked me to give you a call. Would you be interested in coming back? And so I said, yes. So he then, texted me from Puerto Rico over the holidays that, and in January, he drove to, uh, to Connecticut to have breakfast with me at my favorite diner. <laughs> and, and, and we talked and I agreed to come, but I wanted to finish the semester over there. I came back because in the end, I'm a CUNY kid. I know. Okay, I'm a CUNY kid, uh, four degrees, all CUNY degrees with professors who couldn't have been, I was just back at Queens College. I have to tell you, they invited me to speak on those kids the way they gravitated because I look at the audience. It was a celebration of black and Latino students there. And I said, I'm looking at this audience and I see myself, I don't know, a few decades. I want to say a few to be modest. I said, yeah, but really, frankly, you could all be my grandchildren, you know? And they started laughing. And in fact, when I was at Albany, one of the students from Queens College came over. She said, I got to come see you. You have no idea what it meant for us to hear you speak. And, and, and so CUNY, what CUNY did for me, a young immigrant who married young, to another immigrant who was also young, and everybody said this marriage will last six months. It has lasted <laughs> more than five decades, you know? Uh, and um, I finished high school and we got married. And then we both began to go to Queens College at night. Uh, it's just an amazing thing what Queens College did. Liberal arts, liberal arts kids don't ever, I know that I'm talking to the right person. That's don't right. ever lose heart in the liberal arts. Okay. Now, when you came back, did you have, it must've helped you though, having been to Hostos, at some point, what did Linda, you remember? Linda, there, you were, remember? there were some processes that had changed a little bit. There were right. some things, but there were many faculty because you know, one of my biggest accomplishments was that I really had this drive with Esther's support and everybody's support. And also CUNY was giving community colleges faculty lines. And we hired so many people. So I knew, I knew you, the ones who were here, the ones who some of you have retired that I'm sorry, you retired, those who retired. And then I came back and there were some of the folks that I actually uh, recommended to the president to appoint who are doing great work. Look at the engineering programs and all those right. gooders over there and everybody else, you know? So I came back and it's the same passionate, you know, they get all whatever, you know, but uh, they care. The faculty really cares. The staff really cares. And they do, the great majority is absolutely uh, wonderful. You can have, 
the kind of success that also has had, that we received the Mackenzie Scott, that we were nominated again for an Aspen, that we were named number four for, for social mobility by the, by the Brookings Institute. All of that happens when there are, there's all this work, not just now, but continue. And I am a firm believer also that every single president of this institution, different personalities, different styles, everybody really believed in the mission and really believed in the college and, and behave in different ways, but everybody. And, 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 and for that, uh, you know, the South Bronx has benefited tremendously. You were a very influential provost. I mean, I will say without any hesitation that when you were on as provost, you really gave the college a really good academic emphasis that I think we still benefit from. So I always thank you for that. I think that was a game changer, to be honest with you. We're all really college. good. There no, was a was. good so group of you. Now, that was well, really good to me. Waiting to for somebody to, we were waiting for somebody to say, let's do it. So that I think was really exciting. Now I referred to you and others as a pandemic president. I mean, oh my God, what was it like? What has it been like to be, I know we, we're, we're, to be a president during a pandemic? What have you had to confront and how have you dealt with that? I do not envy you at all. Well, you know, I think coming from literature helped a little bit. Yeah. So, the, so the seminario came out of, you know, the experience of reading Chaucer and reading Boccaccio's The Cameron, which is you have people going through different plagues and telling stories <laughs> to survive the spirit. And I figured, how am I going to stay in touch where you hear multiple voices that, but we communicate weekly and send a poem and invite the students to participate. Uh, the middle states love that as well. Nelson and Kate could tell you. And by the way, Nelson, because I said to Kate, who's doing this? The way he wrote those updates, sheer poetry. I said, we have our own William Carlos Williams here. You know what I mean? <laughs> what the heck? You know? It's really nice, it is. It really, I mean, the most beautiful prose and very poetic, very, very poetic. And, and, and just all, all the voices there, a student government leader, you hear uh, the, uh, the nobility of some of these kids going through mm -hmm. some of the very difficult times that they have. And then different folks, and we celebrate everyone and we invite everyone. The only thing that I should have done before, Linda, and you will remind me next year, is, is that right before poetry, month, we're going to ask for all of the secret poets of Austos in the faculty um, to reveal themselves, and then we will feature them in the seminario for, for Poetry Month. Okay? I have to think the advice to read Boccaccio to get through a pandemic as a president is, a for, is you, you heard it here on EdCast, and I really <laughs> think I am definitely going to be putting that on as a tag. I have to tell you, we had to be Boccaccio. <laughs> we have to be tame, not so, you know, a uh, little bawdy like it was. We have to be, <laughs> we have to be educational about it. But, but, but you know what I mean. It I is about it. hearing exactly. multiple voices and understanding that there's a life there and that we all have hope, that yeah. we don't lose hope. Because if we lose hope, our students will lose hope and they need yeah. to stay engaged, you we know. Do know that and we need it for ourselves as well. Oh, you know? We certainly do. Um, we know that the pandemic has, of course, brought about some problems in education. And I mean, hostos and nationally, there have been some issues with retention and enrollment. So we are going to talk about that for a bit. And I am going to bring on now to join us our own vice president for student development and enrollment management, Dr. Latoro Yates. So let's welcome him to EdCast. Joining us now is Dr. Latoro Yates, who serves as the vice president for student development and enrollment management at Ostos Community College. He brings experience as chief of enrollment management at four-year private and public institutions. Dr. Latoro Yates also works with urban school districts guidance departments to use data-driven solutions to improve student outcomes in areas such as college enrollment and career-focused initiatives and activities. He is a first-generation college student and Jersey City native. Thank you so much for joining us today and welcome to EdCast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be You're here. You're welcome. 
One of the things we began to talk about is, of course, some of the downsides of the pandemic, of which there are many. But in terms of education, we know that um, enrollment and retention are things that people always talk about. How has HOSTOS been affected in terms of enrollment and retention? Sure. So community colleges um, nationally started to have issues with enrollment before the pandemic. So what happened during the pandemic just exacerbated some of the trends they were already um, kind of percolating, if you will, um, with enrollment. So um, one of the things, if, if we look at the, um, the amount of students that were graduating from high school, that was something that's been talked about for many years. And then we really started to see that impact. And then once COVID hit, um, it was just something that was not, a, it wasn't a way to plan for it. And what colleges and universities have been trying to do is just recalibrate and look at, it helped, we are having to have reshape how we think about recruitment and how we recruit students. And you may have heard the term admissions funnel or recruitment funnel. And we're really having to think about how do we re-engage students back to moving towards some of the quote unquote normal ways of doing things. But the important part is how do we introduce lessons learned during COVID? Because I do think that there are some, some things that we had to, some muscle we had to develop that we should continue to use as we plan for the uh, plan for the future of enrollment. So what are some of the things that you have been doing and that the college has been doing in this direction? Yes, yeah, so the, uh, one of the things is that we have to make sure that we are able to get back into the community and really just engage with students, get engaged with parents, engage with community leaders, engage with churches, engage really with everyone that's involved and let them know that host those community colleges a place that we're here for them and also look for every opportunity possible to create entry points for students into the college. And, and one of the ways of thinking about doing that is prior learning. So for a student in any way that they can earn a credential, how can we have those credentials kind of stack, if you will, as an entry point into the college? And then recognize that we have some students that are utilizing going to college as a, a point to get a credential to work towards a job. But how do we continue to re-engage them and get them to continue to move and earn credits and work towards an associate degree, which can only help their lifetime earnings? Have you been looking at, um, when you, in terms of recruitment, are there different ways of recruiting students now post-pandemic? Do we look at different demographics? Are we looking at different groups? How do we recruit now? So that's, that's something that's um, it's a hot topic nationally. How do we recruit? <laughs> I know, how do we recruit? <laughs> but one of the things, the tried and true methods of recruiting students is really just going meeting students where they are and giving them the information about how to engage with your institution. But I think one of the things, one of the things that COVID created for us is opportunities to engage students at a wider reach. So what I mean by that is students that were a lesson learned during COVID, during the the first run through co um, dealing with the COVID pandemic was that students wanted information specifically to, as an individual. So if I'm a student and once I'm accepted into an institution, maybe I live in a certain zip code, or maybe I'm studying math, or maybe I'm an athlete, or maybe I wanna run for student government. So once they start the application process, they want information tailored to come to them almost in a specialized way that they receive other types of information. So that's one of the goals. So when we are now moving to, hopefully one day we're gonna get very soon, we can get back to recruiting students in person in very large gatherings, their traditional kind of open house and yield events. But the lesson learned is there are students who still want a virtual experience as a part of the way we do events moving forward. So I can envision that we would have an open house but then in a classroom, we can have a teacher having a virtual lecture going on during that time period. Or we may have another room where there are parents that are doing a virtual parent workshop. Or in another room, there may be coaches, um, athletic coaches that are giving virtual workshops about athletics while we have this in-person event. So it's really thinking about how can we maximize all the different ways of stimulus and connecting to students. That's ambitious. That sounds really good. Um, I want to ask both of you something now. We've heard the term re-engagement. And re-engagement has certainly been used to attract students who may have left, to get them to come back. 
But I also want to look at re-engagement in terms of the students and faculty that we have right now. This morning, I read an article from the Chronicle of Higher Ed that talked about how faculty are saying how hard it is to reach students nowadays, that they're anxious, they're stressed, they're overwhelmed. They seem to be disengaged. They are, um, if they're doing a synchronous class, they're still not on screen. Um, you know, they're not participating. So uh, President Dave Philippe is also from your perspective, do you see this as an issue? And what are some of the ways that we can really revitalize our campuses in terms of students, you know, feeling more engaged? I, I have to say, uh, Linda, that uh, I have taken, since uh, we, we came into this semester to really walk around, to talk to the students and I walk around a lot and I stop, you know, I'm very approachable. I'm also very curious, so I ask questions. So uh, our students are there playing the piano. They show me their paintings. They're sitting at a table doing biology class studies together. They, uh, one of them just yelled out this young woman who coordinates um, students with disability. Coco, she says, Coco, I see you in person, Coco. You know, <laughs> she came to hug me. So I talk with them. They tell me, many of them, that they're happy because the circumstances are such for them that they are happy when they they are the happiest when they are at the college yeah. because they feel you know there's a food pantry that's open there's a library and their computers their sitting areas uh, their their faculty and and other students that they can talk to uh, but it it is uh, coming back gradually and we take a step forward and another one back sometimes with this pandemic, but we're moving forward with as much care as possible. And also the, the VP didn't tell you that he, they are also mounting a campaign in his area to reach out to students who were there, stopped out and then come back this semester. So they're reaching out to those students to bring those students back. We're also very much aware that some students are only gonna be part-time. Mm -hmm. And so we need to look at the class schedule so that they can come evening weekends that they can complete what they work. We're also creating through the Mackenzie Scott jobs and campus opportunities for you each to have your own uh, uh, and mentor them a little bit. I always said, cause I used to have them, I used to uh, fundraise in Connecticut. So we had jobs on campus there. And, uh, and I, I always have one in my office. And I always said, if this child doesn't have any significant work to do, no, playing games in this office, they have to do homework. And we stayed on it and we had cakes and they had all the departments, a little birthday cakes. And at graduation, you could see them. I would meet them, my, my wonderful colleagues in the parking lot. And they say, oh, this is for my, my student who's graduating. And so they're having a little party for that student. And it was because many of them also lack this issue of having a parent right. that can dedicate and ask questions. Just asking questions, where are you? You know, when is your midterm? When is your paper due? When is that whatever? Do you know that there's Hulk over here and that you can go over there to get support and all of those things? So I think in multiple ways, this is what they tell me. And they tell me a bubble wherever, and that has been throughout, not only here. It was at York when I was at York, it was at Nagato Valley. Here is that, what is the best thing you could say about this institution? Is it the faculty care inside and outside the classroom? So thank we are running out of time, if you can believe that. So I want to go back oh, yeah. to the eights for a moment. And I want to ask you, tell us a little bit about that campaign about reaching out yes. to students. And also from your perspective, uh, supervising the coaches and the advisors, what are you also seeing in terms of how students feel? Yeah, so thank you for that opportunity. So the just to add on to um president laid it out very well. When we, we are re-engaging with students, and in, because there was some recent um, data from the release from the Clarence House that approximately 20% of students in the South Bronx have some college. And there's a pool that needs to be re-engaged back with an institution. So we're gonna have a, a, a very aggressive campaign going after those students. And we know that some of those students are former Osto students. So we're going to create a campaign and it's radio ads, it's digital ads, it's making sure that we let students know that Hostos is a welcoming place for them. 
And then it's looking at uh, and working with the um, SSCU, um, the, the advisors, and working with um, um, OAA, Academic Affairs, is just really looking for any opportunity to remove barriers for students that can help them persist. We want to utilize data to be able to help students think forward. So if they're going into each semester, they know how many credits they need to kind of stay on schedule. And if that schedule is moving them towards graduation. So we're going to be data focused, but working with the coaches and having them have constant contact with the students and really helping them gauge what do they need to, um, to persist and move forward. Can I just ask you briefly, what are the biggest barriers that the coaches and advisors are recognizing for students right now? Um, so it, it really it really depends, but I think for, it depends on, it's almost kind of for student for student, but some of them um, are really working towards trying to get in specialized programs right. and really understanding what are the steps that's needed to get into those programs. So that's a great opportunity for us to work with students from the moment they check a program on their application for us to communicate with them before they become registered as students right. and really sharing as much information with them as possible. So as they, by the time they start to engage with the success coaches and they start to engage with faculty, that they are fully aware of the type of majors that they're interested in and the path that they would need to take to successfully um, navigate that experience. So we're going to have to wrap it up, but I would just want to ask each of you just briefly one top priority that you have moving forward. BPH, we're gonna go with you. First, what is your top priority moving forward? Top priority is working with that re-engagement population. That's a very ripe opportunity for Hostos Community College. And I wanna be a part of leading a team that goes after that population and make sure that we let them know that Hostos Community College is a place for them. Fantastic. President Coco de Felipe's top priority. Right now, because we just finished with the middle states and I, you know, and there's a lot of information as we begin to work with another very large group on the strategic planning uh, process that will take place in the fall, we're organizing it, is to make sure we plant the seeds for a future harvest for our future students so that OSTAS continues to move forward in the absolutely beautiful and generous way that has moved forward all these decades in support of our wonderful students. Thank you, Linda, for this opportunity. Professor Hirsch, thank you. I thank you. you both for joining me today. And I feel so fortunate to have been part of Hostess Community College as the president of my entire youth. I mean, I really <laughs> given my youth to Hostess Community College. I mean, it, it was I, a baby when I met I her. Was. It was, but it has been an absolute <laughs> the most wonderful place to be and spend a career and know that, and, and I agree with everything you've said. So thank you both so much thank for joining you. us today. President Daisy Coca de Filipes and Vice President Latoro Yates. Thank you all for joining us for this edition of EdCast. See you next time. to hear from you. Please send your thoughts and comments to cunyedcast at gmail.com.